Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in our Talks with Walt as we are calling our readings through the deathbed edition of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. We are in, in Leaves of Grass, crossing Brooklyn Ferry. We now turn to passage number five. Many consider this to be the heart of the poem. Certainly, Whitman has kind of set us up now for what is about to happen. Now, our assumptions are that you've been following our stuff together with us at LearnStrong.net. Down that left-hand side, Talks with Walt, the name of our playlist. I hope you have your own copy of Leaves of Grass, and I hope that you've been working with us from the very beginning, the inscriptions, we've worked every line of, of every poem up to and including Crossing Brooklyn per, uh, Ferry Parts 3-4, uh, which we treated as a unit together. And now we come to passage number 5. Um, we're going to hear right away some of the echoes, you'll see this, from passage number 3, uh, The Distance Avails Not. I also want to point out the intimacy, and that's why so many readers love this poem so much. I even have had students who say after reading uh, Brooklyn Ferry, I never knew that poetry could do the thing that Whitman does in this poem, of almost like reaching out from the page. We're going to see this a couple of places later in the poem. And he just kind of grabs a hold of you and says, hey, you up there, are you holding me? Are you reading me? And he'll begin with this intimate language right away with a couple of rhetorical questions Let's just enjoy now the lines. What is it then between us? What is the count of the scores or hundreds of years between us? Whatever it is, it avails not. Distance avails not. And place avails not. I too lived. Brooklyn of Ample Hills was mine. I too walked the streets of Manhattan Island and bathed in the waters around it. I too felt the curious, abrupt questionings stir within me. In the day among crowds of people, sometimes they came upon me. In my walks home late at night or as I lay in my bed, they came upon me. I too had been struck from the float forever held in solution. I too had received identity by my body. That I was, I knew, was of my body. And what I should be, I knew, I should be of my body. Now there's so much going on here that we want to pay attention to right away. Notice, first of all, the two rhetorical questions that is set up by our reading of passage 3-4. What is it then between us. Now, of course, this word between, given that we're obviously reading a poem called Crossing, so you've got that kind of thing. In other words, what's going on here between us is a very strange question, right? In other words, what is our relationship? What is it that you're hoping to gain from me? What is it that I'm hoping to gain from you? What is it that I'm hoping to give to you? What is it that you're hoping to give to me? That symbiotic sense. Of course, that notion, we've been, we've, we've been playing around with this in many ways all the way through Leaves of Grass. There are many who see this passage as somehow a culmination of everything they've been reading in Leaves of Grass up to this point. The second rhetorical question, what is the count of the scores or hundreds of years between us? Of course, we, we go back to passage two as he's talking about ages, hence, and all of that. And uh, he, he will ask these two questions and he'll answer it with a non-answer. Whatever it is, that is to say, differences in, and then you just start filling in the blanks. Differences in, and then just bing, 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 bing. Well, so many things are different between now um, and when Whitman was re living and writing this. And he's going to say, oh, no, 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 no. You're totally missing it. There is so little that actually matters in terms of the distance. Now, we're not just obviously talking about physical distance, but we're talking about spiritual distance, metaphysical distance, right? Distance of time, distance of place. Whatever it is, it avails not. Now, of course, this takes us back to passage 3, the opening lines of passage 3. The dash, uh, distance avails not, and place avails not. It's something beautifully powerful about the artistic vision of somehow the transcendence of time and place. And here I think so much of what we read in the opening lines of T.S. Eliot's Four Quartets, Burke Norton is born. Uh, time present and time past is both perhaps present and time future and time future contained in time past. If all time is eternally present, all time is unredeemable. What, what might have been and what has been is an abstraction, remaining a perpetual possibility only in a world of speculation. Let's, let's uh, take a look at now how he plays the game 
um, with I too. Now, let's put it in our notes. We said it earlier. There's the classic poem we've already outlined and, and worked with at LearnStrong.net. That is to say, Langston Hughes' classic, I Too, which is, of course, his direct response to Whitman, both here as well as I Hear America singing. I, too, lived. Brooklyn of Ample Hills was mine. Now, this identification with Brooklyn and with New York City for Whitman is powerful. Whitman is not only the greatest of, uh, as we've said in our earlier lectures about Dante, the greatest universalist thinker, but the greatest individualist thinker as well. Whitman is very similar. Notice here, he's going to say, yeah, the city belonged to me, and I belonged to the city, which is what makes Whitman the greatest writer and greatest poet of New York. That's why we love him so much. I, too, lived. Brooklyn of Ample Hills was mine. This isn't the first time that we've heard about the hills of Brooklyn in this poem. I, too, walked the streets of Manhattan Island, bathed in the waters around it. Uh, Whitman loved that idea of bathing. And then go back, of course, to Song of Myself in Passage 11, and you've got young men bathing, and, of course, some onlooker, and guess what? The word float is going to be used later. So there's all of this echoing that's happening, right? In other words, in the very way that you're standing there now at you know, the East River or whatever, in the same way that you walk the streets. I did all of those things. I was, this, I was the same in so many ways. And by the way, walking these streets will take us back to that really powerful moment in T.S. Eliot's Four Quartet's Little Getting when that, strange, that, that stranger is met. And we're not exactly sure what's going on in, in Passage 2. I'll, uh, I'll let you go back and, and find those comments in those lectures. I think so much of the birth in many ways of T.S. Eliot's work for Four Quartet's uh, Little Getting is actually here as well. Um, I too walked the streets. I too felt the, and then he, there's that word again, right? Curious, abrupt questionings stir within me. You'll remember in Song of Myself, Passage 38, that he says, continue your uh, questionings. Uh, of course, this is, this is our Socrates. This is Whitman tipping his hat to the Socratic, what do we call it, meutica, that notion of asking by uh, learning by asking questions and the like. He says, I had, I felt these curious, notice the word abrupt. There are these questions that just come up. Several of you have pointed this out in our study of Leaves of Grass. It's like all of a sudden we're kind of floating along, can I use that word? Floating along and then all of a sudden there's like this question that hits us that makes us go, oh, yeah, that's a really good question. Abrupt. He says, I too felt these uh, curious abrupt questions and then that word stir. The idea of it's like movement, movement. We're going to get a, a, a chemistry um, a word here and solution here in a little bit. Like there's this spinning. Uh, Yates will call it in the gyre, right? Um, he says, in the day among crowds of people, we've heard about these crowds already, sometimes they came upon me. What is the antecedent of the pronoun? They obviously the questions, right? In my walks home late at night, we immediately think of Song of the Open Road, a foot in light heart did I take to the open word. In, in my, my walks home late at night, we've seen this referencing kind of thing in, in earlier sets of lines, and especially uh, Song of Myself. In my walks home late at night, or as I lay in my bed, we immediately think of Faulkner's As I Lay Dying, lay in my bed, they came up on me, right? Oh, this same idea has never uh, come to the, um, think about it, that, that set of lines. I too had been struck from the float. And again, this word float is so compelling. Do you remember And I sing the body electric? Do you think matter has cohered together from its diffuse float? So these echoes are remarkable. The float forever held in solution. Again, we said how much Whitman loved the new science and the chemistry that was a part of it. I too, the last one, I too had received identity by my body. Now, uh, go back to Song of Myself, passage 48. I have said that the body is not more than the soul. I have said that the soul is not more than the body. And nothing, not God, is greater to one than oneself is. This dualism that would begin with Descartes, I say begin. Certainly Descartes is going to make it the most famous. It's old Kiko Diego Sum and all of that. This idea that there's two of us. There's this body, no question. But then there's this mind, soul, whatever you want to call it, right? He says... Uh, I gained my identity, I received my identity by my body. And then there's this very interesting construction. Notice, we'll put it at, uh, at 2B. Notice the absence of commas. And so it's very interesting how to read these words. That I was, I knew, was of my body. 
comma, he does use it there, and what I should be, I knew I should be of my body. Now, Whitman, many have said, certainly no one before Whitman is as so much a poet of the body as Whitman is. And yet, notice in this set of lines, he is arguing that from his body, he somehow was able to gain some sense of this identification with those yet to come. How is that possible? Well, of course, I mean, biologically, we could say the only way people get here is two people hook up and exchange fluids. We've said that many times in our discussions in 303. There's no question about that. And yet there's something beyond the physical that's going on here in this float that we might say. And where is it all rooted? Well, as we finish now, we'll jump to it in 2A. It all comes back to questions. We think, of course, of the game of questions in Tom Stopert's Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead, right? All existence remains the same. That is to say, the new is the new. The N-E-W is the K-N-E-W. It's just we have this tendency to forget everyone that came before us asks so many of the same fundamental questions. And these questions unite us. This is why we read the great texts from prior, because there in those texts are rooted so many of the questions. Now, of course, we can always debate the answers that are provided. That's why we will often say that we are the stories we tell and retell. We're also the stories we decide to accept or obviously to reject. And yet, buried within those questions that are so important. I mean, think about the questions that we've talked about in our time together. The question, for example, of Achilles to try to figure out in Iliad 9 whether he's in fact going to come back into the war or not, because all of a sudden, on Time, the two things that matter to him in his life no longer matter to him. We called it a crisis of faith, and we've given that lecture at LearnStrong.net. Think about Odysseus and all the questions that are there present in his mind as he's leaving Hades, as Tiresias tells him what it is that he's got to go in between Scylla and Charybdis. Look at the opening lines of this poem. What is it that's between us? I mean, Whitman is in full force here in terms of drawing on the ancient classical tradition. And as we get to 3A here in a second, we'll comment, of course, on how else can we relate these set of lines there. And 2B, though, before we get there, look at the repetitions of I2, I2, I2. In other words, Whitman is pointing out that fundamentally we're all united in our humanity. No matter what it is that divides us, no matter what it is that makes us different, fundamentally the thing that brings us all together are these questions, and this I too is a compelling way to say it. Of course, as well, the rhetorical questions at the beginning are quite remarkable because they achieve a certain kind of linguistic intimacy, don't they? They kind of, it's as if he's kind of saying to you, hey, pal, come here for a second, I've got to ask you a quick question. Have you ever, see, it's, it's, it's brilliant the way he does it. Well, at 3A, I, you know, you've got, to, you've got to find yourself back to, we mentioned Socrates, you've got to find yourself back to Plato. I think that Whitman constantly was in a dance with the dialogues of Plato. You'll remember that Plato says, be kind for everyone you meet is fighting their own battle. And I think there's such a, that's, that's such a humanizing line. Think about the power of Republic Book 7 and the cave allegory and the way in which light is so significant. We even uh, have this word, perspicacity, insight, understanding, wisdom. He says, somehow or another, those questions led me there. Of course, we mentioned Descartes and his dualism as well, the body versus the mind, the physical versus the metaphysical. All of that, of course, in theory of forms back to our Plato and Republic. Finally, how are we going to I, kind of own this set of lines? How are we going to make them our own? A couple of questions maybe that can help you there. What questions most stir you? What is it? I mean, think about our big five, epistemology, what, can, what you can know, ontology, who you are, psychology, what is it that motivates me, what are my fears, what are my anxieties, sociology, why is it that people behave differently often in groups than they do alone, and then finally, and most provocatively, I think, this question of theodicy, what are, what, what are those fundamental questions, and that's why we pick up, for example, Milton's Paradise Lost and we read it. Why? Well, we got to explain away man's first disobedience. Uh, and, and the woe, right, that will arrive because of the eating of that forbidden tree. 
There are questions that are fundamental to who we are. And of course, it's simple to ask, and several of you have started to do it. Why am I actually doing this reading, this study? I mean, it's clearly taking my time. It, I mean, clearly I could be doing other things, and yet I find myself somehow coming back again and again to Leaves of Grass to say, all right, fine, 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 I'll read a couple of more lines. I'll work a couple of more of these lectures together with this lunatic teacher. But why? I think in the end, the questions that we keep coming back to, we have said that that's what makes for us Shakespeare the greatest of them all. Why? As we've said it, because he asked, and what do we say, sometimes answers the great questions of existence. And finally, to, to finish, have you been struck from the float forever held in solution? Uh, this is a, I love that line because it's such a beautiful way to try to capture the way an idea or a question can find root and then we have to figure it out, we've got to work it out. I hope that your reading of uh, uh, Brooklyn Ferry is doing that very thing in the same way that water is always moving. Thank you.